Well, hi, Heart for the World Church. It's, um, it's a pleasure to get to be up here with you all today, and, and um, I'm not in the kitchen, and I'm not back with the kids or at Kid Check, and, and um, it's kind of a different audience, but it's really great to see you guys. You know, um, I love this church. You guys have mine and Dale's heart. We really love you guys, and, um, and, and what a privilege to be here. So you are in for a treat today. You know, Dale, he, he always says, you know, Sharon, it's Mother's Day. You're going to do the message. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and so today, um, I've got my daughters, Heidi and Anna, are going to help. And, you know, we all work with kids. And so our motto is, well, why not? Let's try it. It's an experiment, right? I don't think we've ever done anything like this at Heart for the World, but we thought, you know, it was worth the risk. And, um, and, I, and I actually thought it could even be an, a historic moment because, um, you know, Heidi's leaving, her and her family, they're leaving in a couple weeks for Zambia. So who knows when we'll ever get to do this again. And you're going to find that um, these girls, their words are on fire. And uh, they carry a great anointing of, of the Lord on them. And so I'm going to welcome them up. <laughs> so our message today is thriving under pressure. And um, I know that just that title might make you want to get up and walk out because you know who likes pressure and thriving and pressure don't seem to go together. But um, we are continuing with our story, which I'm hoping you guys are reading, and we're in chapter 18. And um, we felt really relieved to get this story because some of the stories in, in the story are kind of tricky. You know, <laughs> but this one had a whole lot of good stuff in it, and we just felt really relieved that we got this, chapter 18. And so this is in the book of Daniel, and you know, it's about Daniel in the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, so we are going to be able to say by the end of this message that I can thrive no matter what. I want you guys to say that with me. I can thrive no matter what. So that was really lame. But by the end of the message, <laughs> we're going to say it like we mean it, okay? <laughs> so in Philippians, in Philippians 4 through 11, I'm going to just read that to you. It's 4, maybe it's through 13. I'm not telling you this because I'm in need, because I have learned to be satisfied in any circumstance. That's thriving no matter what. I know what it means to lack, to be poor, to have sad circumstances, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance, for I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. I find, I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses in me to conquer every difficulty. And... Um, you know, when we talk about thriving, we all have a picture of thriving, and you know people who thrive. All of us have someone in our life that we know who thrive. You know, Dale is a thriver. Um, you guys know someone in your life that's a thriver, but we have pictures of people who thrive, and oftentimes, our pictures um, in our mind are dist um, they're misdirected, because we think people who thrive have it all together. We think that they have plenty of resources, and they're put together very well. And that is a misdirected picture of Thrive, okay? Let me tell you what thriving is not. Thriving is not a perfect life with no pain or no pressure. That's not thriving. It's not perfect kids. It's not plenty of money. It's not the right house or the right occupation. It's not having all your cards fall in the right direction or all your stars line up. It's not a life that's free from grief or pain or tears. That's not thriving. That's not reality. That's not life, okay? So we're not looking at any perfection here. Um, 
Thriving is, let me tell you what it is. Thriving is sorrow with hope. It's pain with a promise. It's lack with contentment. They kind of go opposite, don't they? It's fear with confidence. It's loss with tears and great comfort. It's a heart focused on a future. We are going to learn that I can thrive no matter what. I can thrive. I can thrive no matter what. For reals. So she got to talk about thriving, and I get the honor of talking about pressure. So here we go. It's hard to know if you're thriving if you don't have pressure. You know, from very little, our moms are teaching us hot, hot, don't touch it, it's hot. You've got to stay away from the pressure, from the heat, because it will hurt you. And today, I'm going to shift your thinking a little bit to think maybe not all pressure is bad. And when I was thinking about pressure, maybe because I'm a mom, maybe because I'm a labor and delivery nurse, maybe because I'm a mom times four, I don't know. I have this picture in my mind of um, me and my sister Heidi. And this picture is for me and for Heidi, I think. It was a dream come true moment for us because um, it'll come eventually. But we had, we both have four kids, but we never had our kids together. So my number three and my number four, I'm like, Heidi, we've got to do this together. And so here we are with very large bellies, uh, five and a half years ago or so, um, getting ready to have our boys just a month apart. And, you know, when I'm thinking about that picture, I'm like, yeah, that was a dream come true, and we're really happy. But what you don't see is the pressure <laughs> that we're feeling. I was four days away from having Simeon in that picture, and just to get up to take that picture was like, oh, I can do this, but there's a lot of pressure. <laughs> and any mom who's ever been pregnant knows that the pressure gets worse before it gets better because you have a labor coming and you have a delivery coming and so you think that's pressure just wait buckle up you know it's coming and we all know that pressure in this case it produces a really great promise it produces this hope that you've been just marinating in for months and months I know this is coming but the breakthrough is requiring a lot of sacrifice on my part and you know as you go through labor it goes from pressure to pain, to burning, to yikes, and then you have this baby, and you're like, oh, it was so worth it. I'm so glad I did this. Let's do it again. You know, that's why I have four kids. Um, the pressure didn't teach me a lesson, you know, <laughs> but pressure can produce a promise. And so the story that we're reading today, it's from the book of Daniel, starting in Daniel 1, and we'll carry it all the way through Daniel 3 in this message. But the story is really a story of thriving under pressure. So it takes place in a time where... Um, God's people, you know, God had a promised land for them, the land flowing with milk and honey. They were living there, and their land, um, you know, they had everything. Like, God just gave them all of this stuff, and they turned their back on God, and they turned their back on God, and they turned their back on God. And after hundreds of years of this, God said, I think the only way you're going to learn is for you to lose everything. So in this time, their land, their nation was crumbling. It was imploding. Things were going very bad, drought and famine and war. And people were actually getting exiled out of Israel. And they were being taken to Babylon, which was a godless nation, a nation that worshipped idols. And among the exiles, the first batch of exiles was Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were already experiencing pressure before the pressure started because they were living in a place that was going, going south fast. So then they get exiled, taken away from their home, their family. They get totally profiled because the king was looking for the smartest, wisest, handsomest, strongest men. And so they got picked out of a crowd to come and to be a part of this kind of like a finishing school, um, the king was going to groom them to become leaders in the nation of Babylon. 
So for three years, they were a part of this school. And in the school, they had to learn a new language. They had to learn a new culture. They had to learn the literature. It was like going to school for three years. Um, and, and the pressure of what was happening wasn't crushing to them. They were thriving. So then the king says, now I need you to eat my food. And my food happens to be food that's been sacrificed to idols because that's what we do here in Babylon. And Daniel drew a line and said, no, I'm not going to eat your food. And he said, instead, I'm going to eat vegetables and drink water and watch me thrive. Now, if any of you have ever been on a diet, I will tell you it's possible to thrive because Daniel did it. He went with vegetables and water for a long time. And it says in the Bible, he and his men, they grew stronger, healthier, and more robust than all of the other guys who were eating meat and drinking wine and enjoying the fineries of the kingdom. If you're on a diet, just say this to yourself. I can thrive. I can do this. (laughs) You can. (laughs) Anyways, so then... These guys, the king recognized them. They were thriving. You know, when you're thriving, people notice. The king noticed, and he was like, wow, you guys, there's something about you. He noticed them, and it says that Daniel started getting wisdom beyond everyone else. He was able to interpret dreams and visions. So later, King Nebuchadnezzar takes the throne, and he starts having these dreams, and they're tormenting dreams, and he can't sleep, and, and um, he has an anger problem. You're going to see this throughout the story, and he orders all the wise men, the astrologers, the fortune tellers, the whoever is wise in those days to come, and he says, you will interpret my dream, and they said, yes, King Sire, we will. Just tell us your dream. And he says, no, I'm not telling you my dream. Then you're going to make up the interpretation. I want you to tell me the dream and interpret it. And if you don't, by the way, I will kill you. So there's that. They're like, well, king, see, this is unreasonable. You are an unreasonable boss asking me to do something I can't do, no human can do. And the king is like, fine, you're dead. So he sends out his guards to kill all the wise men of Babylon. Now, the wise men are not just astrologers and fortune tellers. They're Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And when the guards go to take Daniel away to be killed, Daniel says, wait a second. Hold on. I'm going to ask my God. And Daniel is in this position of incredible pressure. God's going to give me a word or I'm going to die. And you know what? God gives him a word. God tells him exactly the king's dream and interpretation. And after that, Daniel and his friends rose to the top of all of the wise men. They became leaders in that kingdom because they could thrive no matter what. So you talk about an opportunity to be a victim. I mean, if ever there was a victim, it was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They had every reason to blame, every reason to curse. You know, these guys were your picture of a victim, but they didn't choose to live in that story. Yes, these were their circumstances, but they chose to live in a story that was higher than their circumstances. And we call our circumstances our, low, our lower story, but there's a higher story what God is doing. And we call that our upper story. Um, If you take a minute and you look in in this chapter, this book of the Bible, and if you saw it as a mirror, I bet you would say, I I can see myself in some of these um, precarious situations or these difficult circumstances. For one, these guys had to take a new name. Now, if you think about it, how many of you have had to take a new name? Maybe you are newly divorced. Maybe you are a new widow. Maybe you are a new stepchild or a stepdad. And all of these kinds of names, you wouldn't have chosen them. Would you have chosen to be infertile? 
Would you like that for your name? No, you didn't choose that, right? These are names that you wouldn't have chosen, but it happened, right? Life happened, and life happens. They were in a new culture. They had to learn everything about this culture. Some of you guys would say, well, you know, I'm in a culture right now. I am trying to break out of a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction. I'm fresh on probation. I have a child that's in jail. I have a child that's addicted. That's a whole new culture, isn't it? It's a whole new language to learn. It's a whole new way of life to learn. Did you want that? Um, Maybe not necessarily. You would give it back. You wouldn't want to be addicted, but that is your new culture. Maybe you've got a spouse who's deep into addiction. Did you want that? Of course not. Maybe a new home. Maybe some of you have lost income and you are just recently foreclosed on your home. Or maybe you've been kicked out of a home. Did you want that? You know, it's it's a whole new home, a new diet. These guys are on a new diet. I don't know, new diets, it's like what Anna said. Keto, what does that make you think? Does it, does it make you shiver? <laughs> Weight Watchers, Atkins, does it just make you shiver? Kind of. It does me, kind of. But, um, and then, you know, uh, maybe some of you have a new threat to life. Maybe even just this week you had a diagnosis, you know, cancer, whatever. There's a threat to life. There's a grave diagnosis. There's heart disease. You know, that's a circumstance you wouldn't have chosen. Or what if you live with someone that just is ungodly and really does illegal practices? It's something you wouldn't have chosen, right? All of these things we started with new, just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in new names, new cultures, new places. We find ourselves in this story. But don't be deceived. There's nothing new about this stuff. This stuff is not pretty right? It, you know, you think of new, it's fresh, it's clean, it smells good. There is nothing that smells good about this stuff. Not any kind of a, a, a deadly diagnosis and loss and pain. There's nothing new about that. But we find ourselves with this newness, right? We see pictures of ourselves in this story. You know, um, when I grew up, I it, it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of old. And, uh, and so when I grew up, it was in, it was deep in the hippie drug culture movement. And, um, I had a sister that got deeply addicted very young and, and I was very young. And then my brother followed. And for those of you who have grown up in homes of addiction, you know, the pain and the sorrow and the chaos And usually, it's not like a week or a year. Usually, it's years and years and years. And it's promises and broken promises. And it's jail and it's probation and it's crime and it's theft. And it's a a lot, a lot of heartache. And, um, you know, don't think that all those formative years that I grew up with my brother and sister in this kind of lifestyle, don't think that doesn't shape you. This kind of stuff shapes you. It kind of starts to form your beliefs, you know? And um, I, I'm thinking that the one thing I really am so grateful for is that I didn't let my circumstances form my beliefs because if you do, then you will decide that God doesn't care and God doesn't listen and God doesn't deliver and God doesn't heal and God is distant and God is absent. And when you let your circumstances form your beliefs, that's where you tend to live. You live in a life of despair and hopelessness. You live a victim life. Um, You live a life without much of a future. And I'm, I just am grateful that it is something I've learned and am learning. I will never arrive how not to let my circumstances form my beliefs. And you know, that is, um, that's really a choice. You know, it, it's, um, yes, all of this is very real, but it is really a choice. I get the opportunity to choose. Now, did you hear that? 
Now I thought I would say, that did you hear? (laughs) Now, did you hear that? We get to choose that. Yes, when life sucks, we get to choose our beliefs, right? We can live in this story, my lower story, and this story, when, when my brother and sister were deep in addiction, I have to tell you, it was so, so sad, and it, and, you know, and pastor's wives usually don't say suck, but it did, (laughs) and (laughs) it just did, and, um, you know, but we get to choose what belief we want to live in, and, you know, um, that story ended really sad, because I lost both my brother and sister, yeah, they both ended up dying, and, um, and we adopted two of my sister's kids, and so that story ended up really sad. But, you know, I love my brother and sister. Though they are gone, I love them. And I would never trash talk them. I would never belittle them. I would never put them down. I love them. I love them, love them, love them. And I believe, I believe, and I hope that they're in heaven. They both had born-again experiences, you know. They both ask Jesus in their heart. It's a hope I'm holding on to, but I would never trash talk them because I love them. And that's when you let a higher story shape you. (laughs) Maybe you should keep talking. You're on fire. (laughs) I love this. um, This leads into that we are empowered in the midst of struggle. And it get, there's a shift that can happen that we have choices to make. And we see this in this story. These men had a few choices, and they, they chose the right thing. So I thought we would just read this verse, Daniel 2, 17 through 19. It says, Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezriah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And it goes on, the next verse is, he goes into worship. These verses, beautiful of worship. And the, the first choice we have is we get to choose to have a relationship with God. The one true God. And this isn't just a relationship of, you know, making us nice people. This is a relationship with the supernatural God. And when we choose that, we have access to things that other people don't have access to. You see, Daniel knew how to pray. He knew that was a part of his life. He was a prayer warrior. But he also knew how to receive from God. He needed a vision, and he got it. He didn't miss it. Sometimes God's speaking or giving us things, and we're not understanding. We're totally missing what he's saying. But Daniel had that closeness to God. He received it, and then he went into worship. And that's a choice, too. We can choose worship. And when we worship, something happens inside of us. And we say this here. Joey says this. Our spirits get big. They take up space. We can't see it, but they're growing stronger. And when we shrink back in fear, oh, I'm only human. I can't do anything. We shrink, and we get to choose to expand if we want, and that happens when we spend time with God. You guys probably feel it. When you come here and worship, you're like, wow, I feel more hopeful. I feel something. You can do that every day. We could live like that, you know, and that's an invitation. The next thing Daniel did was he went to his friends and asked them to pray with him. He chose what voice is he going to surround himself with. And we all know that. We can either be, we can pull away and just stay with the voice in our head 
that usually is leading us in a pretty um, downward slope of negativity and discouragement. We can choose um, to go hang out with our friends who sometimes are not the right kind of friends. They don't have the same heart as you, the same convictions. They're pulling you. Or we can choose a community of friends that pull us back, remind us. I had this situation happen to me. My family were missionaries in Zambia. And the first couple months that we lived there were really hard for me because if anyone has ever moved to another country, you understand just how vulnerable you feel when you're out of your comfort zone. And it's just this whole new world, a new language, literally, around you. Um, they do everything opposite. They use the metric system, so I'm trying to read recipes, but I, I don't know the metric system. <laughs> I, you know, just from the smallest things, they drive on the opposite side of the road, and um, I'm trying to figure out life with my four boys. How am I going to homeschool? I've never homeschooled before. I'm trying to figure that out. Anyways, I was feeling pressure, overwhelmed. Out of nowhere, my husband gets this injury in his neck. And um, we're able to go to another town and get an MRI. And it's obvious that he needs surgery. But we can't get surgery there. So he's going to have to leave and fly back to the States for surgery. And all this is just like the first three months, you know. And I'm just thinking, oh, my gosh, you're going to leave me here? And, and then I'm thinking, and I want to be with you. Like, this is a scary surgery in your neck. What, I need to be there, you know. And I'm just feeling overwhelmed. And, and I'm thankful for a friend and a sister, Anna. She says, I'll come, Heidi. I want to be with you. She has little kids of her own. She gets on a plane all alone, her first time there, flies to Africa like, of course I'll do that, you know, so brave. And she comes to be with me. And I'm just sharing with her and crying. And she tells me, Heidi, don't doubt in the dark what you knew was true in the light. And I said, you're right, Anna. <laughs> and then she started to help remind me of all the things that were true. The promises God had done, the testimony. He didn't part the Red Sea, Heidi, for you to be here just to leave you. He's going to get you all the way. And, and that community of faith anchored me and brought me um, to a place where I could thrive. I wasn't with my husband, but I felt I knew God gave me peace. He's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. We're going we're gonna to figure this out. And so my heart changed, my inside changed in the midst of that um, struggle. And then the third thing that we see from Daniel and his friends that we have the power to choose our thoughts and our beliefs. Sometimes there was a time in my life when I was struggling with panic and anxiety disorder. And I was having just these horrible thoughts and I felt helpless to them. And um, God told me I wasn't. And I could take my thoughts captive. And I need to start doing it. And that sounds easy, but it's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. Pay attention to what you're thinking. And take it captive, not agree with it, and then choose a new thought. And start choosing God thoughts from the word, from your Bible. Renewing your mind with those things. Shifting from this is too hard to I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it starts to rise in you and you shift what you believe. This happened to me this week. We're two weeks away from going back to Zambia. And I started this thought in my head. I can't believe I'm doing this again. I can't believe I'm doing this again. Just all of the overwhelmed of, of change again and packing and then right then, the Holy Spirit just intervened and said, nope, don't agree with that. I want you to say, I can't believe I get to do this again. I can't believe I get to do this again. And as soon as I agreed with that, thankfulness just came in my heart. And I just started to worship. I had to keep packing, but it changed my perspective. I still have to have hard goodbyes ahead, but I know that God 
has given me an opportunity of a lifetime and I'm not going to go in this lower stance. I'm choosing the higher stance of worship and thankfulness. Amen. That is so good. You know, I posted on Instagram this morning, because Insta. I wrote, and I think all you moms should do this. I put a picture of my kids, and I said, I can't believe I get to be their mom. And it just was this, I have a three-year-old, yikes, and a really mm, strong one. And it just changed everything for me when I realized, oh my gosh, I can't believe I get to be your mom. So moms, try it especially try it when it's messy and it doesn't feel good. You will see a shift in everything, the moment. And also one more piece of advice, say it to them. Don't just say it in your mind, but tell your kids, I can't believe I get to be your mom. This is so awesome. What a privilege to be your mom. It changes things for them too. So that was my little addition. But the end of this sermon, number three, it's called the test. So, you know, we're here, we're thriving, life has been challenging, but we're we're really connected with God. Our prayer life is good. We have our community, they're praying for us, they're holding us up. We're making good choices, we're choosing our thoughts wisely, we're nailing those wrong thoughts, those lies to the cross. We're doing it, like we are in this game. And then all of a sudden, Boom, something hits, it knocks you off your feet and you're like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. And you know, if you're thriving, you're gonna know it when the test comes because um, they have a way of testing you, you know? (laughs) Like if you're a tree and you need to test the roots of the tree, you'll never know if they've gone deep until there's a windstorm, right? And if you're a boat and you need to know if your anchor is really heavy and really going to anchor you, you're not going to know that without the hurricane. And so the test is the way that says, you're thriving. Look at that. And so in this story, we see Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they have a test in front of them. And it's one of those tests that you get in college, maybe high school, I don't know. But the teacher's like, okay, that was great. Close your books, pull out your pencil. I'm giving you a pop quiz. And this pop quiz has one question. And you're like, no, because you know what that means. I either know the answer or I don't know the answer. I either get 100 or I get a zero. And I hated those tests. Oh, the pressure. And these guys were faced with a test like that. And um, I'm just going to tell you the story. It's from Daniel 3. And basically what happened, King Nebuchadnezzar was reigning, and, and he thought he was awesome. And so he decided he was going to build a gold statue um, of himself. And he built it 90 feet high. That's high. And he um, was super proud of the statue. And he, ha- he sent this decree. He said, everyone in all of Babylon, when you hear the sound of all these instruments that he lists in the story, you will bow and worship this golden statue. And anyone who doesn't bow will be thrown into the furnace. And so the music rings and everyone, Jew and non-Jew alike, bow obviously, because no one wants to face the furnace, bow to this gold statue. And a tattletale guy comes along and says, "Um, King Nebuchadnezzar, I just wanted to let you know those three guys that are leading in your country, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they're not bowing when the music plays. And, you know, he loses his mind because he's a rage kind of man. And he's like, what? He brings him in the court and he says, is this true? When the music plays, you don't bow? And their answer is, yeah, that's true, basically. And he's like, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance. You either bow when you hear the music or you burn in the fire. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we don't have to answer to you. If our God wants to save us, he's going to save us. They didn't owe him an explanation. They didn't bargain. Well, let me tell you, we've really served a lot in your country, so maybe you could pardon us. They didn't try to say, well, just let us leave. Like, they just stood their ground and they said, if our God's going to rescue us, he will. And that was their answer. And so, you know, they're between a rock and a hard place. You burn 
or you bow. And they decided, but you know the truth is, they didn't decide right then. They decided a long time ago. (laughs) They knew five, 10, 15 years, I know God. And I will not bow no matter the pressure. Because the truth is, we all have tests. But all of us, when we walk through the test, it produces something called a testimony. And every single one of us has a testimony. And your testimony, it might be your story, but it's somebody else's breakthrough. And when you have a testimony to share with someone else. You don't know what's going to happen in their life because of your testimony. My testimony is your breakthrough. And these guys were keenly aware of the cost. They knew what it was going to cost them everything, but they knew the price (laughs) and they knew that they're, they knew their God, you know? And so the question was, are you going to bow? And it wasn't like, Are you going to worship idols? Because these guys weren't going to worship idols. They were going to worship God. But are you going to bow out of the game? Are you going to decide this pressure is too hot? And I'm just going to go ahead and take a step back and bow out. I'm going to let fear decide what I'm going to do. I'm going to let discouragement decide. I'm going to listen to those voices that aren't from the Lord and decide. And the truth is, when you bow, if you think about it, bowing is a posture. It's a posture before the Lord. And so when their answer was a posture, it was, am I going to bow? And when you bow and you look at the ground and you see this lower story that my mom was talking about, your, your eyes are down when you're bowing, right? And you're reading it and the authors, the, they're really loud authors. And they're things like, my past experience says this. My disappointment with God says this. My fear says this. My bank account says this. And you start just studying the words of this story, and you're like, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Wow, that's good. And the end of the story is, I am hopeless. I am afraid. I, this is too hard. I cannot do it. But these guys, their posture wasn't that. Their posture was to stand. I don't care. What's going to happen? I'm going to stand. And they said, my God can rescue me. They knew their God could rescue them. You know what? Their God rescued them years ago when there was the dream interpretation. And it was either die or interpret the dream. They saw God come through for them back then. And we can all look back and be like, oh, God came through for me then. And he's going to come through for me again. And you start looking at heaven, and your eyes, your gaze is fixed on Jesus, the one who made you, the one who loves you, the one who knows everything about your situation, the one who says, I am here, right here in the middle, and I'm going to make a way when there's no way, and I'm going to provide, and I'm going to send my angels concerning you to guard you this whole time. And when your gaze is up, you see a God who sees the whole story and he's over the whole story. And he's gonna actually walk into your story. And you're gonna hear about that in this next part, how God walks into our story. Mm. So these guys, they've decided they're not gonna bow and they're gonna get thrown into the fire. What's the first thing that happens? They get bound. They get all chained up, all wrapped up. Um, The fire, it's not just hot. It's seven times hotter. Now, maybe there's some chemists in here that know what a seven times hotter fire is. I don't know. But I'm thinking it's pretty hot, a seven times hotter fire. And um, it says that when the soldiers went to throw them in, that the soldiers perished. Those guys lost their life because it was so hot. You know, I could see these three guys, you know, they're friends. So they they drew courage, encouragement from each other. I could see maybe they're elbowing and saying, Meshach said he'd go first, you know? I don't know. But, um, you know, it just seems like it's, you're stronger when you're three, maybe. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but they went, they, they get thrown into the fire. And um, the first thing that happens is their chains come off. And then 
the king looks in and there's a fourth man in there. Now, who do you think was that fourth man in the fire? The interesting thing is when they went into the fire, they had no guarantee of the outcome. They didn't know how it was going to turn out, but they knew who would come. And whether they perished or whether they were rescued, it didn't matter. They knew who would come. And it just reminds me of a story when I was younger and, um, and the doctors had pretty much decided I had MS. And I had to go through all these batteries of tests. Dale, we were young, young husband, two young kids. And I just remember, you know, a diagnosis like that, it kind of rocks your world. And um, I remember the fear and the what ifs and what's going to happen. And so, you know, back then, you had to have a spinal tap, and you had to stay in the hospital for 24 hours. And I remember laying in my hospital bed. Um, I had already had the test done, no diagnosis. And I remember just praying and, and talking to God and saying, God, you know, okay, so what's next? So what if I do have MS? You know, how do we, how do we maneuver through all of this? This is, this is a sad story. And I remember clear as day when God walked in my room. I didn't see him with these eyes, but I saw him with these eyes, you know? And his presence was so real. And he spoke to me, and he spoke to me hope, and he spoke to me a future. And I knew I could face a diagnosis without fear, Because I knew what God spoke to my heart. He spoke a hope and a future. It didn't matter the outcome because of who came. Jesus came. You know, that hospital bed became holy ground. And I'm just wondering what your situation is, what your sorrow is, what your pressure is, what your pain is that can become holy ground. It's not because it looks holy. It's not because of the outcome, but it's because who comes. That's what makes holy ground. And um, (laughs) I'm going to let Heidi finish this last point. What I loved how it ended, they came out of the fire and they were not burned and they didn't even smell like smoke. That's amazing because if any of you have been around smoke It's hard to not let it get on you, the smell. (laughs) But the truth is, they couldn't control how they smelled. All they could control was that decision they made to stand, and God controlled the rest. There was no striving, trying. He met them. He walked in. He freed them from chains, and then he let them come out unburned with no smell. It's amazing what God wants to do when we just take a stand. Even if it's the little stand we can do, but to just look into, to look into Jesus' eyes and choose faith. So we were going we to end the service a little different, okay? And... Um, We felt like God was whispering some things in our hearts. And we're not going to call anyone to come up to the front. But, you know, one thing I love about Heart for the World is that God always shows up. He always comes, and there's always a sweet presence of Jesus here. I just love that about Heart for the World. And this is a moment that we don't want to pass by. And it's not, it's not anything like, you know, to be showy about. This is a moment with you and God, okay? And um, one of the things that we really felt a whisper about is that, that some of us, are in our lower story. We have all these circumstances in our life, and if we had to be honest, we would say it sucks. And we've got our face in the ground, and we're letting that tell us our beliefs. God doesn't listen, God doesn't love, God doesn't care, and it's telling us our beliefs. And God is calling some of us today out of that story. He's calling us out of our lower story, and he says, will you take a brave step and go for the higher story? 
what we felt like God was saying, if that's you, stand up. Just as an act of faith, stand up. Come out of that lower story. Stand up. thing is, you know, God is, he, he is breathing great hope here. You know, it, it's not our words and it's not our eloquence. I promise you that it, we really have nothing to change your life, but God does. And one of the things that we're certain of is that he's here to give hope and he's here for a new start. So I'm going to ask one of you girls, they, they had things they wanted to share too. Well, I had a word in the first service. I feel like it's for the service too, but, um, you know, I saw a picture and, and someone was on the ground and the wind has gotten knocked out of you. And Jesus was right next to you and he was do, doing CPR on you. And it's like, I want to stand. I do, God, but I actually can't breathe. And so I don't think I can stand because I can't breathe. And he was just leaning next to you and, and he was pumping your heart. And every pump, he was just saying, hope, hope hope and every pump he was filling your lungs filling your heart with hope and it was starting to circulate around your body and then he was doing mouth to mouth and he breathed his breath and when you feel like you can't breathe he's breathing his breath into you and so this is for you if you feel like I don't I can't stand right now even though I want to Jesus is resuscitating you and you're gonna have the strength to stand with his breath in your lungs. So if that's you, he's breathing and you can stand. You can stand. I was sensing that um, in the last service, God was releasing a grace for joy. Some of you have felt really tired and um, just weak. And the, the Bible says it's the joy of the Lord that's your strength. And you need more joy, and he's going to help you with that, and he wants to give that away. If, if that's you, you can stand. I also was sensing somebody in here, you, your heart's been beating the whole, this fast, and you've been feel, or feeling something, and you don't know what it is, but it's the Holy Spirit, and he wants you to stand because um, he wants to touch you um, today. And then another word that I had for um, last night, but it's for tonight, You've been praying for a son, and your son needs a breakthrough. And God wants you to know he's hearing your prayers, and it's going to be okay. And if that's you, would you stand for your son in faith that God wants to touch him today? And I'm just hearing this word miracles. You know, I'm convinced that the fire wasn't seven times hotter to kill the guys faster, but it was to show God's amazing power. Like the hotter the fire, the more amazing the miracle. And you might be in a situation that actually is impossible by human standards, but it's just primed for a miracle. It's primed for God to walk in and say, okay, now watch what I can do. So if you need a miracle in your body, in your home, in your family, this word miracle, just stand. This is your day. Believe it. Yes. Okay, so as you're standing, we're going to just declare and we're going to say, God, I'm choosing to not bow. God, I'm, I'm picking my face up off the carpet, off the lower story, off all my circumstances. And Jesus, I'm standing. I'm standing here as an act of faith. God, I'm fixing my eyes on you. You will come. You always do. I don't know the outcome, but you always come. Now, God, I just ask that you just breathe your hope in this place. God, bring your just grace, just grace, grace, grace. God, let your hope drop like you're just raining down on these hearts. Jesus, 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 come. 
there's so many here that are so desperate for your hope. They're so desperate for you, God. They're desperate for your strength. Jesus, just one word, just one touch, just one whisper. Listen for God to speak to your heart. Listen for him to tell you a word. He will. He will. God talks to you. Listen to God. Tell me a word, God. Tell me it's going to be okay. Give me a word. Just one word. Just one whisper. Ask him. in here that's dealing with infertility there's a grace for that today and so I just want you to put your hands somewhere on your belly and I just declare in the name of Jesus that you will conceive carry and deliver a healthy baby this is your day of breakthrough this is your day where God's making all things right in there you might not see it but he's shifting things around and he's creating a way where there was no way And so we just speak to that infertility. You will bow, and we are going to stand on the promises of God today. Jesus' name. Jesus. God, we just release that that oil of joy wants to pour over us. God, would you just pour it over our mind, our thoughts, Lord? Make the shift. Help us with the shift, God, to choose a different thought a different perspective lord release that grace to overcome god empower us with your hope your promises god thank you lord yes Yes, thank you for the breakthroughs in our children that you're doing god as we're standing for more than ourselves but for our kids and our grandkids and you see it god for the generations this is a stake in the ground and breakthrough it's coming like this lightning rod through that generational line and we just receive that in your name Amen. Amen. so god you see every heart here and jesus every single one is written on the palm of your hand jesus you are near to the brokenhearted you have not forgotten God, we just ask that you would just continue your work. Continue your work on this fertile ground, Jesus. Whisper your words of love. God, whisper your words of encouragement. Whisper your words of comfort. God, would you just come to each heart and speak. Lord, we just ask that you bless each one as they go about their day. That you would protect them your face would shine so bright upon each heart here. And we love you, God. 